Hey, today is definitely a day for running around Manhattan. I am just about to sit down with Lindsay McGregor, who is the co-author of the New York Times bestselling book, Prime to Perform, and spoke on stage at Responsive Conference 2018. She and her husband co-founded a company, Vega Factor, which works with both Fortune 500s, but also fast-growing startups and a wide variety of other companies to improve performance. The thing I really like about Vega Factor is they've taken a lot of principles from research psychology. Things like, what does it actually take to motivate humans to do great work? What does it actually take humans to be happy, right? Kind of important stuff, and applied it to the workplace. They pull in a lot of metaphors like, and what motivates children to then apply those to adults and then apply those to adults in the workplace. Actually, we're not gonna talk about that stuff a lot because she covered that at Responsive Conference and she talks about that everywhere. If you just Google her name, Lindsay McGregor, or Google Prime to Perform, you'll see as many hours as you want on that kind of material. They're doing a good job of, of marketing and PR. I'm interested in her as a person. What makes her tick? What's it like to work with her husband or be married to her business partner? Stuff about family, stuff about life, stuff about her own journey to peak performance and less about the business side. So we'll see where this interview goes, but I hope you enjoy it as much as I'm sure I will. It's gonna be a real pleasure to sit down with Lindsay. So thanks so much, see you shortly. Thanks for taking the time to sit down. Thanks for having me, really great to be here. Yeah. When I walked into the building, the, the man at the front desk went super sweet and he was like, oh, if you don't mind me asking, what does Vega Factor do? <laughs> so just as a place to start and, and to introduce yourself and, yeah. and your work today, how would you answer that question to, I think his name is Joseph downstairs. Yeah, so to Joseph downstairs, I would say, you know everything that makes work terrible. <laughs> we fix that. So how do you build the highest performing organization and culture in a way that unlocks the best in people and the best for their customer? So Vega Factor's mission is that by 2050, every organization in the world is operating according to the cutting edge of psychology in terms of what drives performance and what drives human motivation. And to get there, we've got three things that we really focus on. One is um, to teach to educate, to make the knowledge just common knowledge so that the old-fashioned way of running companies through sticks and carrots is completely retired. Uh, the second piece of that strategy is to create tipping points. So we work with organizations to create tipping points in, e in different industries so that people really understand that science can work in their industry too and drives bottom line results. And the third piece of our approach is to take the cost of transforming an organization as close to zero as possible. Right? There are so many talented leaders out there that if you just gave them the tools and the resources to transform themselves, they wouldn't need you know, fancy pants consultants coming in to fix things for them. So how do you make those resources readily available around the world? So it's probably a bit longer of an answer than you wanted, but <laughs> there you go. <laughs> what did you want to do or be when you grew up? So when I was growing up, um, when I was five years old, I would sit in my bedroom and I would line up all of my stuffed animals and I would teach them things. So all my stuffed animals <laughs> knew how to read, they knew how to do math, I wanted to be a teacher. Okay. Um, and the most amazing moment to me was when you would see um, somebody, you know, when you're in middle school and you're tutoring your friends or you... Um, you know, I'd start to volunteer and tutor elementary school students in my community. You see the light bulb go off in them. That was the most inspiring moment to me. And it was only re recently when, after I gave a gave, uh, speech about high-performing cultures, that somebody said, you know, you're just a teacher in another way. And what you're doing with organizations is teaching them how to unlock themselves rather than you do the work for them. So I think there's a common thread there. Yeah. Did you have, where did you grow up? I grew up mostly in Los Angeles, okay. um, so at, in the San Fernando Valley, home of Clueless. Okay. Um, yeah. And uh, so every single time that I do not say like in the middle of the sentence is a victory. Nice. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I get that. Uh, siblings? Yes, I do. I have two siblings. My older sister um, lives in South Africa. That's where you know my dad grew up in um, in southern Africa, okay. um, and my younger brother is in Indianapolis. Okay. Yeah. And what did your parents do growing up? My mom's a teacher, 
Uh, so I think that probably had something to do with it. Um, and my dad was in business, he was in advertising, really thinking through how do you tell um, authentic stories to people. Hmm. And what was the, I mean, it's, it's like how, how did your parents support you developing the skill set or the confidence or the upbringing that led you to where you are now? Mm. That's a good question. Well, one, thanks mom and dad, right, <laughs> if they're listening. Um, so we moved around a lot when I was a little kid. Uh, my mom is from England, my dad's from Southern Africa, mm -hmm. and um, it, for the first eight years of my life, every two years or so, we were in a different location. And I think, and had the for good fortune of having family in many different countries around the world. And I think the first thing they taught me is that everything you assume that's normal or the way things are done mm -hmm. just isn't. It's so context dependent, it's so different. You can't take anybody's perspective for granted. So I think that was one incredible lesson that they gave me. And the second was that a complete love of learning. Um, right? My mom is the type of person where if you take her into the local um, bookshop, you'll be there for seven hours. And that love of reading every sentence, really understanding the deep why behind everything was hugely, hugely inspiring. Mm. That being said, I think a challenge that my whole family has had to overcome is, um, you know, we study human motives and what motivates people, and we have a very, uh, Vega. Vega. we have Vega factor. Um, we have a very strong tendency to put a lot of what Vega calls emotional pressure on ourselves. Of you know, you owe it to live up to your best potential. You're obligated to do to live. You know, to there's a lot of guilt sure. in, in the whole. Um, that I think my whole family has spent a long time really realizing. It was a big aha moment for mm. me in doing all of the research behind um, our book, Prime Perform that all of that emotional pressure and obligation that you feel actually reduces your performance rather than enhances it. Yeah. So that's been a big journey for all of us too. Mm. And what is that, mm, yeah. when did that start for you, that recognition internally for yourself? It was, I, I really, there are some people who just intuitively understand how to live their best lives, right? <laughs> These are the people that are the natural born football coaches on that television mini series who can get up there and inspire everybody and I'm not that, I had to learn it. So we were studying all of these different theories from psychology. Um, when? Um, this was um, probably, my co-author Neil started to study this about 20 years ago. For me this was probably more like 2007. Um, I'm going to yeah. interrupt yeah. Neil, who is also your husband and yep. also your co-founder. husband and co-author and co-founder of Vega Factor. Oh. Um, and we were trying to understand which of these theories about what motivates people and what unlocks performance operates at the scale of entire organizations. Could it work, could these theories not only work in a laboratory, but at the scale of Southwest Airlines, right? And it, could it predict things like customer experience, and sales, um, and things like that. And there was one approach that we started to get real results from, um, based off of self-determination theory. Um, and in that, as, as we built on it, we re the, the data clearly, clearly showed that when you're motivating somebody through emotional pressure, like fear or guilt or shame or FOMO, right? Fear of missing out. Um, or economic pressure, which is sticks and carrots, or inertia, like you're just doing it because you're doing it. The results were measurably lower. And I had to see that because I did not, I would have thought that if you felt um, that if you, I, if you put enough pressure on yourself, you could accomplish it. And so is that your yeah. experience, like growing up or in teenagehood or in college, of like pressuring yourself to perform? I think until um, college, I was very. I just did everything because I loved learning it. Mm. As you have that yeah. spark, right? From when we first met at the yeah. conference, you seem to be so glowy. You seem so excited by yes. whatever and, and yeah. present is actually yeah. the word that I would use to describe. Mm. Um, when I see you interacting with people, when I see yeah. you on stage, you're very present with your audience. Yes. Uh, and so I've been wondering, is that a learned skill? Or is that something that, again, the, the natural, the person who is the natural football coach just has? I think I lost my way. I think I loved to learn as a kid. And then when I got to university and you start to see everybody who's um, trying to join the rat race and applying to the same three jobs and trying to get straight A's and worried about their future. 
all of that started to really compress. Mm -hmm. And Where did you go to? I uh, went to University? Princeton University, okay. which has an amazing love of learning component to it. And Princeton is also very much an Ivy League and a pretty well, prestigious. Yeah, a lot of high achievers. Yeah. Um, and their mission is incredible. It's, it's Princeton's in the nation's service and the service of all nations. So they've got this really pro-social, purpose-oriented mm -hmm. mission. But I often, um, one, of, one of the things that I realized that I was starting to use that to guilt myself as well. Mm. Like I not only have to be um, super successful, but also be like constantly, um, like if I'm not giving of myself to a degree that's painful, um, I must not be trying hard enough. Yeah. Like pain meant that I was trying. Yeah. And it was only when I started to read this research that I realized actually, <laughs> Like, mm. The people who say that work should be fun, there's something really there. The pain is not an indicator of how much, whether you're doing enough. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So good momentum. Yeah. yeah, it's a really false trade off between mm. the two. And so, up until yeah. college, there was even even while you were yeah. aiming high and you know applying to Princeton yeah. and getting in, for example, you were really deep in the love of learning. And then somewhere along the way, you lost your way. Yeah. And you yeah. ended up at McKinley. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And you were there for four years. Four years. Yep. Okay. And got to lead some incredible um, projects where you get the ability to just work across lots and lots of organizations and understand what are all the performance challenges. And, you know, I remember being in a New York City office building this gorgeous strategy for a company, you know, spending weeks and weeks on my PowerPoint. At the same time, there's a big office building being built next door. And I think they built 20 floors of the building at the same time it took me to make 20 PowerPoint pages. <laughs> and I, it made me question the, you know, <laughs> what I was doing a little bit. But again and again and again, these organizations would, um, would um, say, you know, great strategy, but um, how, how do I build a culture around that? How do I really motivate people to perform? And at the time, the best I could say was, well, you know, here's some examples, or here's some case studies, or you should have a mission statement, which didn't feel, you know, like that was a... Thorough and human. Yeah, it wasn't thorough, it wasn't, um, and it wasn't quantitative. You mm -hmm. couldn't say, you know, I realized when working with these big companies that um, they, everything they're looking at has an ROI, and I couldn't tell them the ROI of culture. I didn't know. I didn't even know if it mattered. Yeah. I didn't know is culture a moral imperative or only, or is it a business imperative? Sure. Do you need it for performance? And so that's what really motivated me to try and unpack this this, this research and figure out does it matter to business, or is it simply about being a good person, do good recruiting? Do you only need it in competitive talent markets? Fortunately, the answer is it helps with performance too. What are some ways that you? Uh, two sets of questions: one about yeah. about your team here internally yeah. at Vega, and the other about parenting. Mm -hmm. um, so first, what are some specific practices that you apply internally at Vega mm -hmm. based on on your story, on yeah. going through this growth and and coming back to a place of presence and a love of learning? Mm -hmm. So. In the early days of Vega Factor, we were feeling really disconnected. We had people, you know, in in different cities, at different clients. Everybody was everywhere. You feel like, even though it's a small team, you feel very, very disconnected. And so, one of the first things that we implemented was um, a Friday afternoon um, huddle, a reflection, where we all get together. And the core of our research is based on building organizations with play and purpose and potential. So we would get together and every week people would share stories of where they found play and purpose and, and potential. Play would be things like, where did you learn, right? What did you learn? What did you experiment with? What did you test? Purpose is what impact did you see? And potential is, you know, how did you um, personally develop your skills in, in really interesting ways? And we did that for a couple years and then um, somebody said, you know, um, we're always fo we tend to focus mostly on the positive things. So can we also share like all the things nice. that we really got wrong? And so now we've got a channel to um, um, sort of Slack channels to both celebrate impact and also celebrate what we call waffles, complete flops. Yeah. Um, to really just you know it's it's acknowledge the reality uh, yeah. and celebrate it. And it reduces all the emotional pressure that you feel that you have to be perfect every time. Yeah. How much of that pressure do you still have? You need to be perfect. Yeah. Um, it's, 
I, I go through waves. So they'll, I think, Fun. yeah, I do like, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a good way to put it. Um, there will be times when I'm really focused on what I'm learning and just thinking about how do I have um, impact for the people that I'm working with and it's super fun and then you'll go through a couple days where you're in a funk and you'll wake up and I'll, my mental mental um, story in the, the other day I woke up and I said oh that's about eight meetings today that's eight times that I might let somebody down <laughs> like that is a terrible terrible way to think about the day that like you've got eight opportunities to disappoint somebody like hold up what are the eight things that you could learn today or that could be different or interesting um, but you go through waves as well? Yeah, I, yeah. Um, I don't know, I think it was probably Joel Gascoigne from Buffer mm -hmm. who I interviewed on stage at Responsive Year One who described the pendulum swing of business mm -hmm. and at the time I think we were talking about financial transparency mm -hmm. and like how much to share and how, you know, or, or hierarchy, right? How hierarchical yeah. to build this organization and, and it goes back and forth over years. Um, I've been trying to, uh, so I sold my cafe in November of 2018, mm -hmm. and so all of a sudden I had, I don't know, realistically 25 hours a week, that, and, and more than that too because I didn't have a piece of my brain always mm -hmm. on the puzzle, yeah. always on the things that I could be doing to improve that project, um, and so I had a whole lot more free time to train. Mm. Um, and so it was really joyful to jump into, uh, I have a group that I train with three to five days a week, mm. two hours a day in San Francisco, handstands and gymnastics and acrobatics. Yeah. Um, and then to find, maybe over the holidays I was prioritizing family. And so there was this tension of like, how much do I, time do I yeah. spend on my most important relationships and how much time do I spend training? Yeah. And like, I think you and I both know there are always trade-offs. Mm -hmm. Right? Like, I have a puppy. She's getting, she's now just over a year old. She's requiring a whole lot less energy, mm -hmm. but I also crave that, like, the early, earliest, precious puppy time, right? Yeah. And, like, there's, there's always trade offs. Um, and so rather than judge myself for, oh, I could go spend this weekend with my nephews on, mm -hmm. on my parents' property in Sonoma County, or I could get some more work done, yeah. right? Like, there's no one right answer here. Yeah. And the, I, I certainly am better at it than I was 10 years ago, mm -hmm. but that reminder and then building in systems in my life to reinforce that that can actually be an easy decision and that yeah. there isn't a, a right and a wrong answer in this case. Yeah. Mm, absolutely. What are you, so you're uh, going to be a new mother. Yep. Yeah. Um, what are you most excited about and what are you most nervous about for a parenthood? Oh, interesting. So I'm most what am I most excited about? One is, I just love, this is very tactical. I love kids' books, so I am most excited. <laughs> Me too. Yeah. Uh, so my sister has a three-year-old and a six-year-old, yeah. and yeah. we've been pulling kids' books off yeah. of what is my bedroom in my parents' house, yeah. right, my old bedroom in my parents' house, and it's like, Mr. Silly Pants, and where are the wild things? And like, there's yeah. so many when I think about who I am, like yeah. reading Robinson Crusoe and like the original Robin Hood mm -hmm. and I just started listening to Sherlock Holmes book yeah. on tape read by Stephen Fry, mm. which is fantastic. Oh, it's like check 70 that. hours. So, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but like reading with my dad Sherlock Holmes yeah. at five years old was such a significant life experience yeah. when I look back on it. Yeah. And what, what kids books are you thinking about? Oh, I just love all... I remember um, one of my favorite teachers ever, um, uh, when I was in third grade, Michelle McKenzie would have, um, she would always do a unit on Cinderella stories, right? And she would have Cinderella stories from around the world. Oh, cool. um, and so you'd see all these different versions of it from all these different cultures and just seeing and with different art and different um, storytelling techniques and just being able to think so expansively and creatively. Um, or now with my nieces. Um, hearing about what they're learning about in school, you just, it's, um, it just leads itself to so much expansive, expansive thinking. Um, but then I think what my husband is really excited about, about having a kid, is that so much of the research that we've done around, that we do with companies around play for potential, actually started with kids. professors doing this with kids. Um, so we love um, teaching this, re when we go into companies and we teach this research, 
we realized in the beginning that we were framing it as why you should care about company performance, mm -hmm. and that a lot of people were kind of like, uh, <laughs> like <laughs> I do enough for my company. Yeah, right. <laughs> And so we started to teach this around, you know, what is this research study about your kids or your marriage? And if you start to experiment with it in your personal life, um, then you can't help but unsee it in your, in your work life. Oh. Um, and so we share a lot of experiments about how when you use sticks and carrots with kids, it backfires. So I now either have an amazing opportunity to experiment or an amazing opportunity to become a complete hypocrite. Um, so we'll see. <laughs> is, that, is that the, the nervous? Like, is that a piece that you're hesitant around, or is that hearing that Neil is excited about that? Yeah. Well, I'm just think he's more excited about experimenting on our kids. <laughs> I think friend, that sounds a little odd, a, but <laughs> a dear friend and collaborator of mine was in yeah. fact a uh, Skinner Box baby. Mm, interesting. Uh, yeah. So that yeah. was, her parents were both, are both, her mother recently died, but were both recent uh, PhDs, psychology mm. PhDs, one of whom had, had some work with Skinner. Yeah. And so like, she was full on put into a Skinner box. Uh, How did she feel about that? Uh, yeah, no, no, <laughs> said not, not in yeah. a nurturing environment for yeah. a baby. Yeah, I can't believe it. Um, so yeah, looking forward to it. Cool. Um, I'm just going to ask lots of personal questions and sure. feel free to demur. Um, what's it been like partnering with your husband to build yep. a company? And I, I don't actually know if you yep. were together when you started Mega Factor or how yeah. that came about. But so, mm -hmm. my dad and his sister built a company together. I've always, yep. uh, when I was running my cafe, like I've always brought in significant others and people who I love to work with. Yep. But I also. You know, I've lost relationships based on doing yeah. that. Like that is not an easy thing. Yeah. Because you have to both love the business, but also love each other just a hairs more than you love the business. <laughs> yeah. So I was so judgy in the beginning. Like when I first, um, Neil and I were working for the same consulting firm when we met. And I, before that, I would say, why would you ever date somebody who worked at the same company as you do? That's so dumb. You know, there's thousands of fish in the sea. Um, and then we met, and I was like, oh, I'm like, you don't really control this emotion. <laughs> um, I was very annoyed. Um, and uh, the so before we went on our first date, I had to go talk to HR, which I'm sure was very pleasant for him. <laughs> but I'm that's a great. rules person. I'm like, we have to follow oh, the rules. Horrible. And that's he's great. like, we haven't been on a date yet. I'm like, yeah, still. <laughs> I, I like so, that you had him do that, and yeah. I like that he did that. So, yeah, so I guess it was his first trial or his first test. That's great. Um, and when we, um, I think one of the most important things when you're setting up a company is that you're looking for people who have common values. Yeah. Right. You want somebody who's got a similar vision, um, and and has say really deep common values, and I think you look for that in whatever type of co-founder you have. Um, so we had a lot of years of testing before we started Vega Factor, yeah. which I think really, really helps. Um, I think the second thing that really helps is we have been trained in the same model yeah. of problem solving. Cool. Um, and when you've got a common language for how you solve problems together, um, and a lot of consulting firms, your first two years, like any pride of authorship is just completely beaten out of you, right? Like you do your PowerPoint page and then it gets redone by your manager and it's done by the next partner and the next partner and the director and then at midnight before the client meeting, it all gets redone again. So after two years of having your work completely, yeah. you, you actually realize the strength of that, yeah. of teaching, treating things like wet clay that everybody's molding together as opposed to well, your homework that you're supposed right. to get an A plus on. Your, yeah, it helps just, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hmm. So. Neat. How do you, uh, I don't know, like group think is the, the negative version of mm -hmm. that, but the positive version of that I think is just like a very positive culture yeah. and a very collaborative culture. Mm -hmm. How do you instill a very collaborative culture at Vega? Yeah, so um, one of the things that um, we think about when we recruit is the um, there's a Yale a cappella group called the Whiffin' Posts. Um, and what the Whiffin' Posts do is they, um, you can only join them towards the very end of, of university. And they look at all the other a cappella groups and draw the best member of every other group. 
And so when we brought together our team, we realized that we could bring in only people who had worked at the same companies we had worked and thought the same way we worked. But instead, we tried to think about, okay, if you want to create the highest performing culture and organization, what are all the different things that influence that? And how do we find people with all sorts of different ways of addressing that problem and bringing them together? So I was worried that when I left you know, a big organization with tons of smart people, I might not learn as fast. But I've been really fortunate that we have built this team where people have these towering strengths and things that I know nothing about, well, um, which is really, really cool. And the humility like you have, and it sounds like you're fostering a team that has the humility to recognize that someone else is an expert and to go to them and not let your own ego get in the way. Yeah, we talk a lot about um, the, the balance of confidence and humility. Right? How do you how do you get both? And it can be really both are really difficult when you're trying to, for on the confidence front, for example, when you're trying to convince an organization that there, or show an organization that there is a different way of running performance, it takes a lot of confidence to be the person in the room that says, I, I believe this better. Yeah, yeah, I believe and not in be you. A snake oil salesman. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but there's also a lot of humility in saying, you know, every organization is different. So what I've done, you know, a dozen times this year isn't going to be like the, the answer for you, right? It has to change a little bit. Oh. Um, and I think that comes into all of the problem solving that we get to do as an organization is how do we, is really working with our people and how do you advocate for what you believe in while also being humble enough to listen and learn from others. So you've worked in a lot of different industries, helping organizations in a lot of different industries. Um, do you have any favorites? Mm. That's interesting. I think it's just fun to get to know new and different industries. Um, and to have a, it's, I think actually the most fun is when you're working with, at the same time, with organizations in very different industries from each other and recognizing similarities. Um, so for example, um, one organization we're working with right now is a hugely fast-growing technology company. Um, and the, when you look at some of the challenges that their engineers are having or their sales people are having, it's actually very similar to um, a nonprofit ed tech company that we're working with mm. um, and a CPG company that's looking at you know how do we move into the next generation of goods that people want. And being able to make those connections and tell those stories across it is what's been really, really fun because you just get outside your normal river of thinking so quickly. Hmm. Can you give an example of you know something with the engineering team that applies to the CPG? Like yeah. What's what's a yeah an example there? Yeah. So, um, for example, one of the most common challenges that we hear is that our our leadership isn't communicating enough with us. Um, we don't know why decisions are made. We don't know what's happening. Um, and the, the knee-jerk reaction is, okay, let's get the internal communications department over and let's produce more memos and more emails and um, more slacks. And then everybody says, I, you know, <laughs> the other complaint they all have is, I'm completely buried just responding to my emails, full-time job, right? How could I possibly do that? Um, and the, um, the other theme that comes out when people talk about that is I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Like, I don't know what the mission of the company is, the direction of the company is. I don't know how to take ground. And therefore, um, they request that their leaders start being very explicit in what they're supposed to do. Then the flip side to that becomes, um, well, I'm micromanaged. I have no freedom, no ability to implement. And um, the one of the the really interesting um, ways to start to address that is to, instead of just communicating more or micromanaging more, is how do you take the, um, the big company objectives or goals that you have and break them down into very small, very specific questions and challenges that each team could own and take forward and go on themselves. Um, on the CPG company there, one of their challenges was the original goal or objective was, um, was you know, we should focus on Walgreens as a client and stop focusing on some other, right? 
And um, so the response was, everybody stops delivering good service to all the other clients, right? And the leader is like, no, the reason I want to focus on Walgreens is because they're going to help us, they're going to be really innovative in this particular product, so I want to use them as the test case to prove how awesome this could be, so we can't drop the service levels for all the other clients, right? The goal is that everybody, that once we prove it with Walgreens, we can, we can learn, learn, learn it and scale it elsewhere. Um, and it was, so how do you create that context sharing? Um, a similar story that happened with a, a tech company that was scaling really quickly in San Francisco was um, they had just implemented Agile and they had implemented it in the system of super micromanagement to the point where we, which is really common, to we were sharing the foundations of a research and the CTO got up on stage and took the mic away, which is never something you really want on stage. Um, and said, You're on stage, and he comes up. Neil, my co author, was on stage, and he took the mic. Okay. Um, and he said, um, You know, my engineers all feel like short order cooks. Um, like, you're essentially like putting in an order for eggs or fries, and you ask them to like bring it out in 10 minutes. And they have no creativity, no in innovation, no nothing. Yeah. It's the same thing as saying, like, focus on Walgreens without giving you any context, any understanding of the problem solving, the scope, and breaking down the challenge to a point where we can actually, your best ideas should be coming from those People engineers. The work. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's fun to see the connections across it all. How did you, uh, you and Neil and the team, yeah. try to solve that problem for the, the tech company for the CTO? Yeah. The, um, when we work with engineers, what we found is that um, a lot in the shift to agile, a lot of companies have gone from two-year waterfalls, um, right? Where first the customer experience thinks about it, and then there's the product manager designs it, and then there's the designers and the engineers and QA. To then it gets to the customer, and then you yeah, start all over again. Exactly, and agile took that two-year waterfall and turned it into a two-week waterfall. Like it's the same thing, um, where the product manager is defining all the specifications, and the engineer just builds it. Right, but it's not and, a constant feedback loop. Right, it's, the original or, intention was that you would truly have a cross-functional team where everybody is solving, understands the challenge, understands the customer problem, and solves it together. Yeah. And so um, we've ha found this incredible increase in velocity when you change the routines that a team work, works in, where you get that cross-functional team together, um, usually on a weekly basis, sometimes more frequent, sometimes less frequent, and the, what the team is working on is not how you know how do I how can the user do X or how can I build this feature, but what's the problem we're trying to solve, and really collaboratively brainstorms on what are all the potential ways that we can solve that problem, and then really focuses on how do I create the true um, MVP of that uh, of that um, outcome that we want, and it's completely, it takes the, really shifts the engineers from order takers to collaborative problem solvers around the customer problem in a really powerful way. What did you do to implement that specifically with yeah. that team? Like what, what is yeah. your engagement or did it look like with them? Yeah, so often the, um, the first step is to help the leaders of a team see what the desired end state is. So take them through a couple of days where they look at Okay, what's all the science and psychology of motivation and performance, and how do I play what we typically call the game of impact with our team, right? So think about, you know, every week you've got a board game in front of you, and your, your goal is how am I going to really drive impact for this customer? And you've got a bunch of different pieces on the board. You can um, influence your strategy, you can influence your operating model, how you work together, and you can influence skills just what we can personally do. And the team gets together and thinks about, if these are our three levers, what do we want to focus on the next week? What are the things we could actually accomplish or change in the next week? So you teach people that sort of game of impact. It's, it goes back to the earlier part of our conversation where we said it's not about being perfect on everything all the time. It's these about things, taking those small yeah. daily steps towards the growth that you want to see next. Yeah, and figuring out of the hundreds of things we could do, what are the two or three that we want to prioritize? next. Yep. And then once people understand that um, sort of end state vision of how to work in this really inspiring adaptive way, 
then it's implementing that work into the routines. So we'll join those team routines, sometimes for a couple weeks, sometimes for months, until the team's really figured out how do I run a team meeting where it's not like a stand-up, where it's like, what are you doing, what are you doing, what are you doing, what are you doing, micromanagement, quit. But, okay, you know, here are the three critical challenges we're solving. Um, here's the ideas that we had against them. What do we need to talk about to really minimize it, to make it impactful, to test whether it works? You're jointly, pro you're collaboratively problem solving rather than just assigning people micro pieces of work that they can't possibly screw up. Yeah, one of the most common and, and the biggest praise that we got from response mm -hmm. conference, or one of the top three or five, was your idea of total motivation. You got a dozen or two dozen emails saying, oh my god, Tomo, that was my big <laughs> idea from response conference. Yeah. So for, for folks listening and watching, what is total motivation? How do you achieve it and why does it matter? Yeah, big question. <laughs> so um, it all comes down to this fundamental truth that why people work determines how well they work. And there's a spectrum of reasons why people do anything called the total motivation spectrum and we used to call it Total Motivation TOMO for short. Um, the spectrum ranges from when you're working because you love the work itself to you're working just for something completely disconnected from the work. And we'll go through the, the motives, if that's all right. Uh, the first motive is play, when you're working simply because you love the activity. So if you think about any hobby you have, if you think about a teacher at play, it's the teacher who loves coming up with new lesson plans or ideas or just just has fun doing it. Handstands. Yeah. Exactly, handstands. Yeah. You just, you just love it, yeah. right? Um, next is when you care about the impact of the work, so purpose, you, can, you really deeply care about the outcome. Yeah. Not just what most companies do, which is the big mission statement, but you feel like if you don't show up today, yeah, no, something you care about. Very much happen. the reason I built Robin's Cafe yeah. was the serving that community. I lived in that neighborhood for 10 years. Yeah. Knowing the people who were there and mm. the service that a cafe in that corner would be able to offer them. Yeah, exactly. And you pro you felt like if you didn't do that, yeah. it, was it, was a, it, was, yeah. Yeah, it was a fallacy for it not to exist and someone yeah. had to do it. So yeah. just do it. Exactly. And then there's potential, which is when you're working for some second order outcome of the work, which usually is, you know, this is a good stepping stone for my career. So, mm -hmm. for example, um, a teacher may have may may or may not have a player purpose for what she does, but she'd say, you know, I really want to be a curriculum designer one day. Got it. And uh, this is a stepping stone to get there. Are there other reasons besides career advancement? Yeah, potential is um, a quite nuanced one because it's anything that's a second order outcome of the work, because which means... What, what about, like, yeah. there for me, so much of, and I think for yeah. you as well, so much of what I do in my life, not yeah. so much of my career, is out of the desire to learn. Mm -hmm. Yep, is that, that would be play. Okay, so that's, play that's is play. like just okay. love of learning and experimentation. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Other second order outcomes are things like, I like coming to work because I've got good friendships here, or um, like the job doesn't exist for you to make friends. Right? The purpose sure. of your work isn't for you to make friends. Yeah. Um, it's just a second order outcome that you, you like. Cool. Um, play purpose potential, all are connected to the work itself. So they drive up adaptive performance. But as you move along the spectrum, you get into things that are completely disconnected from the work. So with emotional pressure, which is that fear, guilt, shame. Um, then economic pressure, where you're using sticks and carrots. And finally, inertia which is um, when you can't even describe why you're doing what you're doing. Right? We've all been there. We've all been at dinner with our friends who say things like, why are you still doing that? Why are you still in that job? Why haven't you left that relationship? And you're just like, mm. like I don't know. I can't explain myself. And that's inertia. And these motives act so consistently that we can boil them up into a single concept called total motivation or TOMO, where you add up the play purpose potential and subtract the emotional pressure, economic pressure, and inertia. And the higher that you can get those good motives and the lower you get the bad ones, the better your adaptive performance will be. So you'll be more creative, more innovative, have better problem solving. You can even, ch we can measure the tone of a group, uh, change it through how they work, and increase things like productivity, sales, customer experience compared to control groups that are doing the exact same work, mm -hmm. um, but not but not working in that high tone way. So hmm. it's um, it's a very, whenever, 
the, the number one question to ask yourself is why am I doing this? And then how do I make this more about play, purpose, potential, right? The learning, the impact, as opposed to emotional pressure or economic pressure or inertia. So I'm going to a brunch this weekend. My husband told me he's going only because of emotional pressure. So I've got to figure out something else we're going to do this weekend that's fun for both of us. <laughs> so. Awesome. Well, for folks listening and watching, where can they go to learn more about you and about your work? Thanks for asking. So they can go to primetoperform.com. Um, our book, Prime to Perform, has all of the research, but also how do you implement this in the company. And they can also, on that website, measure their TOMO. So there's a bunch of surveys where you can measure your personal TOMO, your leadership style, or send out a, a survey to your team that will ask, get assess their TOMO and what's driving it and give you an anonymized report back that you can all use to learn from and move forward. Um, and con feel free to contact me anytime. There's details on the website. So I love teaching this stuff and hearing stories of how people have implemented it. So I hope that people reach out. Awesome. Okay. Thank you so much for taking the time. Thanks so much, Robin. Appreciate it. You're, uh, I love your hands stand like they'll pull up. What's this pure fly? <laughs> I, I mean, there's actually very little that that doesn't fall into those two. Yeah. For me, I mean, there's plenty of emotional pressure and plenty of yeah. the, the, the darker side of it, but like, no, there's like sheer motivated by joy, yeah. learning, and then there's clear purpose and like, yeah. Yeah, it's hard sometimes because the same. When you want something really, really badly, you have to, I have right. to actively manage myself to make it purpose as opposed to emotional pressure. Yeah. Right? Like, it's not about not living up to yourself or not making it, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Where do you and Neil want to take the company? Um, I mean, that 2050 mission is real, so we got a lot of work to do. Like, you know, a lot and, of, and like, yeah. mm, that's funny. I don't know if I believe by 2050 we can take every organization to, like, yeah. Uh, that's that's tough to acknowledge that I don't know, especially aloud. I, I don't know if I believe that. Um, where is that, like, mm, you so light up when you're talking about the work yeah. and you're you know, so clearly deep in the work. Um, where is the company and sort of the, the ebbs and flows of yeah. the company development? What are you looking for the most and what are you struggling yeah. with the most? Um, like we know that we can do this work and have incredible impact. Um, at for like the Fortune 500 sure. like, company that can spend on it. Yeah. And so what our and every year that we've existed, we've been ordered to we've been able to cut the costs of transformation by an order of magnitude. Whoa. So that's been really cool. That's pretty cool. Um, for us now, it's figuring out how do we um, so success like another sweet spot now is like. 200 people. We've gone from like we need to work with a thousand or more people at a time to we can work with 200 people at a time and really create a great business case for them. Cool. Um, which is a lot of sort of fast growing tech startups. Yeah. Um, you know, like 1,500 people, we take one unit of 200, prove it works, and they scale it out. Yep. Um, and so the next step is how do we, and we were able to do that because of uh, the technology that we have. Um, that so we have a software platform that we use to help you know we train everybody and those software tools help them implement cool. this change yep. and so the next step is how do we make that software um, easy enough to use that it becomes that, a slack equivalent or that it becomes yeah, a yeah exactly like right now you still have to use it in conjunction with consulting to make it, Got it. to learn about it yeah. um, and so how do we make that um, Anybody well, like a small team? How many people yeah. work at Mega Fifteen. Fifteen. So, yeah. And you expect that to grow? Do you want that to grow? At some point. Um, for for now, we'll see. Yeah. Um, we've got a great. We're we're continuing to um, really, um, really, really. Uh, we want to like make the shift soon from it has to be consulting to you could do it on your own, yeah. and that how fast we can get there will shape it a lot. And how that yeah. shift works. Yeah, yeah. exactly. But so. with 15 people, you only can do a limited number of client engagements at a given time. Yeah, that's true. Um, but we get we get to to pick some really fun clients where we get to learn a lot. Yeah, so, yeah. Well. It's a trade-off between how much time do you spend 
teaching and educating um, people how to do the consulting work. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, versus, well, building a team yeah. who are doing that is yeah. a whole different thing yeah. than doing the work itself. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Thank you so much for spending the time. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Yeah, I appreciate it. I'd love so, to have you and Neil back on stage again sometime soon. That'd be awesome. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, it was fun to get to meet your audience. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah.